Good afternoon. This is your host, John, of The Research Review, creating a platform to connect and inspire. I'm here with another excellent guest today, Anna. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your research? Hi, um, I'm Anna. I'm a third year neuroscience and computer science double major. I've been studying here under the guidance of Dr. Richard Piet, um, and I've been studying how serotonin affects kisspeptin neurons and how they affect fertility. That sounds awesome. You told me you're a neuroscience major. You didn't say anything about computer science until just now. I actually ended up declaring that as a another major this semester, actually, just a couple months ago. Um, I ended up taking a programming course um, in what was supposed to be my final semester, and I'm like, hey, this sounds pretty cool. And I absolutely loved programming after that. So I'm like, okay, um, what can I do to combine the two degrees? Yeah. So now the main idea is to do computational neurobiology once I graduate. So that's actually a complete blend between the two majors. Now that's cool. So, yeah. So, you discovered neuroscience or you discovered computer science afterwards. What was the name of the course that got you interested? It was programming for scientists. It's uh-huh. supposed to be kind of be like, "Hey, how do you analyze your data for science and it's using Python, which is pretty much a beginning computer science language." Yeah. And from there, I'm like, oh, this is great. I loved doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like trying to figure out a puzzle in order to get an end result. Yeah. I never really had experience with it in the past. So it kind of came out as a shock to me. Hey, I like this. And I'm able to apply this to what I was already doing. Because as more and more data is produced by research, where you're going to come up with more and more ways to try and analyze it. Mm-hmm. And that's where the computer science aspect kind of comes into play. Yeah. Trying to analyze big data and kind of coming up with new computer models of how to analyze the brain are really interesting and becoming a lot more common. Mm-hmm. So um, I was like, oh, okay, cool. Let's go ahead and see what this direction leads to. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Well, because the brain kind of works like a computer, doesn't it? Yeah. At um, least that's my perception of it since I don't particularly, uh, it's not my area of expertise. <laughs> um, beginning neuroscience majors kind of learn, think of the brain as your computer or think as a computer as the brain pretty mm-hmm. much. Um, you're going to hear the term neural networks quite a bit um, in either of those fields and it's pretty much kind of like once you think of your brain, it's the pretty much the motherboard for the rest of your body. Everything's controlled by the brain. Yeah. And it's incorporating all this sensory stimuli. So I have a water ball here. I'm able to see the water ball. I'm able to feel the water ball. And all that input is going into your brain, being processed, and then it's going back out and either being processed or something like, oh God, I lost my train of thought. (laughs) But it's kind of cool because your brain's taking all this sensory information, processing it, and then will give you an output like your reflexes, for example. Um, You knock over a water bottle, you're instantly reaching for it, but that's all being processed in your brain without you even knowing about it. Mm -hmm. No, that's really cool. And how much of the brain do we actually understand? Um, that's is a very good question, and it's really hard to say because we're learning new and um, more stuff every single day. Yeah. So it's really, really hard to say because we're just learning so much. Neuroscience isn't a new field. It's been around for centuries. Mm-hmm. So um, it, every little part, there's something we're going to know, and it's going to take us quite a few thousand more years for us to completely understand the rest of it. Yeah. Dr. Andrew Huberman or Huberman uh, has a podcast. He's a, a neuroscientist who works at Stanford, I believe. Yes. yes. And Stanford School of Medicine. In one of his podcast episodes, he was talking about how something that was newly discovered with your eyes, people think the eyes are connected to the brain. Well, I mean, they obviously are. But... Um, he said the eyes are actually a part of your brain itself. Oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah, huh. his his podcast is very interesting. Um, he has all types of different guests on there. But I'm, I'm very glad that you brought up the fact that you took programming for scientists. Um, did you touch it in, in SAS at all during that program? 
I've used R before to analyze my own data. Okay. Um, it stands, SAS stands for Statistical Analysis System. Yeah. Um, there's different types of those, I believe. Don't don't take my word for it. Mm -hmm. But, um, it, like, we've touched on it in a class before, but I don't know too much about it. Okay. For a couple of the project or one of the projects that I'm working on, I am uh, learning SAS and then touching on Python a little bit too. Okay. I, I was looking for a course to take on that to like add into my college curriculum, like a structured thing, but it's something that I'm personally looking into. And it is interesting. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It is interesting. And it's, yeah, something that I don't think I would have discovered during undergrad if I didn't do research, you know, oh, the whole yeah. world of uh, programming and computer science. I didn't either. I didn't really um, think about it until I started analyzing my own data, and we had to use the programming language of R. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what got my foot in the door. Like, I would just have to change some numbers here in order to figure out where we were in a graph. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what got my foot in the door of it, because I'm like, who needs programming? We're right. a neuroscientist. So after that, I was like, you know what? It would be beneficial for me to take that course. And that's what ultimately led me to do this. Mm -hmm. But you liked working with R, you said? I did. Um, R was really nice for helping to visualize our data. Yeah. So as we were going through our experiments, we would have regions of interest, which were cells that were able to fluoresce. Mm -hmm. And we would identify those, and then we would pretty much have that turn it into like a document that we sent through R, and R would pretty much be able to tell us like where the baseline is and where like the peak of the drug effect was. Yeah. So we were able to change the program depending on where we were able to see it. Okay. You use this for the first project that you were working on? I did, yeah. Okay. Is this something that you, you did you learn R in your course or did you teach yourself on your own? I kind of taught myself on my own. Mm -hmm. um, someone already made a program we were using and then just kind of getting, looking at it and being like, oh, I'm able to change this in order to change this. That's kind of how I got my foot in the door with trying to teach myself. Okay. If you were to give a piece of advice for, say, someone like me or other people who um, are jumping into moderate computer programming or statistical analysis systems such as R, what would, you, what would that be? Nothing beats taking a course, but I would recommend um, looking at YouTube. There's plenty of different um, resources on there specifically for what you're doing that are able to walk you through and sometimes teach you better than just reading through a textbook. Yeah. Please don't read through a textbook. No. Um, the programs are changing every single day. Mm -hmm. So like I've been learning Python for a couple months now and there's been a couple updates since then that pretty much if you do one thing, it might be deleted or yeah. change to next version. So just kind of go on YouTube and take it slowly, and there's no better way to do it than learning through projects. So you can make like a tic-tac-toe board, mm -hmm. roll a die type of thing, but that really helps you build those skills for what you need to do. Yeah, that hands-on experience and actually um, actually acting out on the information. Oh, know, yeah. Is, that, that personally helps me learn a lot, too. Yeah. Actually seeing it being done. I was going to suggest YouTube is what I've been using. Um, those... How to for dummies books. Do you know those? I do. Yeah. Yeah. They have them literally for everything. They have yeah. how to use SAS for dummies. How to use R for dummies. Mm -hmm. Those, in my opinion, in my opinion, <laughs> those books are horrible. Um, <laughs> I think they're also like three inches thick too. Yeah. Um, no one's going to read through that. Um, mm -hmm. It's just much easier to find a YouTube tutorial. And that can teach you everything. There's some uh, websites that have like a four hour long basic to Python mm -hmm. or basic to R videos that you're able to follow along. And if you have any issues, you're usually able to send them like an email or a chat or yeah. something like that. And they're free too. Oh, yeah. That's the yeah. best part. <laughs> um, you don't have to pay anything right. to learn how to program. I mean, big shout out to the people who took their time and like actually put that out there. Yes, I'm very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would not be like, I guarantee a lot of people would not be where they're at today or we would not have so many new sparked interests if this material was not made available for free. Oh, right. So that big, yeah, big thanks to that. Now, um, a guy Huberman I was talking about earlier, specifically he talks about um, neurobiology. I know you said that you were interested in computational neurobiology. Yes. What does that look like specifically compared to the other... Um, subtypes of neuroscience, I guess. 
So computational neurobiology is pretty much using a computer model of the brain mm -hmm. um, to kind of see how does this work and are these mechanisms actually functioning together. I don't know too much about it. I just started dipping my toes into it, but that's the general consensus of it. Um, it, it's also used to process data as well, since you are mixing computers and neuroscience, but that's pretty much the main thing from what I've seen so far. That's got to be the coolest thing. <laughs> it is really cool. Um, there's some, we don't have any computational neurobiologists at Kent, sadly, but mm -hmm. there are uh, microscopes <laughs> that um, pretty much are able to take a brain and you're able to kind of do a deep dive into it. Um, so you're able to go through the layers and you're able to see all the neurons. Really? It's really, really cool. Wow. Um, it, they just got that piece of equipment a year or two ago, I believe. Um, have you been able to use it yourself? I have not. Um, okay. <laughs> it's a super expensive piece yeah. of equipment. Undergrads are not allowed <laughs> to use it. I'm not even sure if grad students are actually mm -hmm. because it's probably worth more than like, it's quite a bit. So like in the millions? It's probably close to that, yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's on, the only one in Northeast Ohio, I believe. Wow. Um, it, so it, it's a really nice uh, machine. Yeah. But <laughs> you're able to go through and see, like, the brain pretty much from the inside. Mm -hmm. You're able to see all the neurons, and they're all lit up. Yeah. So it's really, really cool. Are they naturally lit up? Or do you have to? No, you have to have a dye in it. A lot of the um, science people that have came, come on here and talked about all of the really cool fancy equipment like electron microscopes and all that kind of stuff, they said they're not allowed to touch it either. Yeah, um, they don't want an undergrad to break it. And I don't blame them because they're beautiful yeah. and I would hate to be the one that damages it <laughs> in the slightest. I honestly don't think I would really want to use one personally because I would get so nervous doing it. I don't know if you're able to see this, but... This is like kind of like the model um, for like a spinal cord. That's what they're what you're able to see pretty much. I can't find an image for the brain. So, so that that's what like the spinal cord would look like under this thing. Yeah, that's crazy. So the the image you showed me of the spinal cord under the um, the microscope that you were referring to, definitely something you're probably going to be like using in the future. Um, it, quite possibly. Um, mm -hmm. like it's such a cool piece of equipment, and oh, I would love to use it. Yeah, it has got to be the coolest thing. Before you decided, before you discovered your passion for computers and such, um, and you decided you wanted to go into computational neurobiology, what concentration of neuroscience were you looking at beforehand? Like I when you first entered. I was looking at neuroendocrinology. Mm -hmm. um, originally in high school, I took a, an AP bio course and we talked about um, neuroscience. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And yeah. then the next unit was the endocrine system. And I'm like, I love this even more. So I'm like, why don't we just combine the two? And that's a really popular concentration here at Kent. Mm -hmm. We have quite a few uh, neuroendocrinologists here. So it's really, really good if you're interested in yeah. that. And endocrinology, the uh, the study of hormones. Yes. Okay, and that's similar to the the research project that you're working on right now, right? Oh yeah, it completely ties into mm -hmm. what I've been working on. Okay, when did you start this project? Uh oh, gee, when did I start? Probably um, around 2020, um, when everything shut down, was when we originally started. Okay. We just ran our first pretty much calcium imaging test, um, and then the university shut down that afternoon, actually. Really? So yeah. you guys were so, off to like a really rough, rough rocky start? Yeah. Um, it, he just came to university, and we finished setting up all the microscopes, finished getting everything in, and mm -hmm. then um, we tried our first experiment, and then we got an email saying, hey, everyone's going home, the university's going to be closed for a little while, and we <laughs> thought it was while. only going to be like, I don't know, two weeks maybe, yeah. which then turned into about a year. Um, so the project was on hold for a while. When we came back um, in the fall last year, um, oh gee, that feels like forever ago, um, it, we started up the project again mm -hmm. and I did an individual investigation and then I extended that project to include the summer as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've been working on this one since last fall. Yeah. Yep. This must be a, a 
pretty big project? Like a lot of people are working on this? Um, it, it's just myself, um, one other undergrad, and then two grad students. Yeah. Um, so it's not as big as what you'd think, but we're all looking at different things right now. Okay. So, so I don't know any of their information. Yeah. So, but what's the, um, the goal of the project as a whole? And then what would be, um, your specific concentration? So the goal of the project is to determine in general what the circuitry between, um, caspeptin neurons and, um, ovulation pretty much i'm looking specifically at how serotonin affects kispeptin neurons mm -hmm. which then in turn affected gnrh neurons which are gonadotropin releasing hormones yeah and this releases a very important hormone called um, luteinizing hormone or lh lh will then come on and affect the ovaries and the ovaries will be like, hey, it's time to ovulate. Let's yeah. release a bunch of other hormones, and those will act upon the caspeptin. Serotonin does play a role in this, though, and that's what I've been looking at. It's not 100% sure how serotonin affects this. Um, in this specific population, I am looking at preoptic area caspeptin neurons mm -hmm. um, in my experiment. Um, there's another population elsewhere, but I'm not focusing on that. So right now, um, it's believed serotonin increases the activity of caspeptin, which then pretty much causes the rest to cascade. Yeah. But um, it, the mechanism of this is unknown. We don't know if there's an intermediate between the serotonin and caspeptin or not. Okay. And that's what we're trying to figure out. But all the reactions that occur afterwards are understood? To an they're, they're mostly understood. Um, there's something called the HPG axis, which is the hypothalamus. Oh, God, I can't talk. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, the hypothalamic um, gonadal axis. Wait, wait, both oh, okay, wait. Nice. oh, no, I forgot the P oh. in there. Uh, <laughs> hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Hypo there you go. Hypothalamic. No, okay, never mind. Okay, you know what? It. Here we go. I just want to try and say it's it. It's there at the top. Hypothalamic. Pituitary gondol axis. Okay, yeah. that's that's close enough. Um, so no. that axis is actually pretty understood. It's been pretty much understood since the mid seventies, roughly. Yeah. Um, so we're pretty confident in how that mechanism works. Mm -hmm. The kispeptin, though, is a. It was studied around the same time, but they lost interest in this after a little while because who cares about female fertility in the 70s? True. So we started looking at this again mm -hmm. um, and trying to figure out the entire, like, how this affects everything else because we know that the um, GnRH neurons are acted upon by something else. Yeah. And we know that to be kispeptin. There's two other neuron groups called the candy neurons that do also play a role but we're not looking at those specifically for this project okay what are the um like main functions of the candy neurons so the candy neurons they're understood to be um regulators of fertility because mm -hmm. peptin specifically is the ones that are pretty much driving that lh surge which is pretty much the cause of ovulation yeah and that's what we've been focusing on the other two subgroups of these candy neurons are not nearly as um, understood, and they're actually kind of weird in how they function as well. So we don't really know too much about them in comparison. Uh huh. You you, you mentioned so many like different types of neurons. I I know we have what like eighty six billion neurons in our brain or something uh, like that. Eighty six billion. Eighty six yes. billion. Okay. As of re recently, what we decided on. Yes. <laughs> as, you, as you said, it keeps changing. How many different types of like neurons are there? Because originally when I started to study science, I thought that they were all the same, you know? Oh, oh and no, I'm coming to realize very that different. I was very wrong. You know what a neuron is? It's mm -hmm. a cell that's pretty much transmitting information. That's what a neuron is right. pretty much. Um, it, but they're, all the neurons are specialized in some way, shape, or form. You have some that are specific to sensory input. Mm -hmm. So um, there's different sen like um, neuroreceptors like in your finger, for example. And yeah. there's four different ones specifically for touch. Really? Yeah. Um, so they all have a different function. So like one can feel like the brush of a feather. One's yeah. for pressure, um, for example. So 
it's really hard to say that all neurons are neurons, but they're all different special, um, specialized very much. Right. Like one neuron is specifically for this purpose type of thing. Yeah. That's so weird to think about. It is really weird <laughs> to think about because you wouldn't think, hey, um, it, there's like four different touch receptors. Who would have thought about that? I didn't know that until I took a course here. Mm-hmm. And we, we definitely didn't start out with four different touch receptors. It's like interesting to think why we developed those. It is really interesting. Um, and there's neuroscientists that are looking at how um, like development is, like why do we have these specialized neurons? Um, why do some of them travel from the nose to the brain, for example? Mm-hmm. Um, and how does that affect puberty? There's researchers looking at that. It's really, really cool seeing um, what do these specialized neurons do and how do they play a role in this grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. Did they look? Do they look the same underneath of a microscope? Do you know? No, they do not. Really? Um, they look pretty different. So I know what the the general image of a neuron is, like with the structure, with the axon, and their tentacles. And that is your stereotypical neuron. Yeah. Um, they look. They I look just a lot pulled up different this one. Um, oh, okay. So they'll still have like a cell body, and then they'll have like a bunch of offshoots at one of the ends. But how they're structured, like some of them are going to be longer, some of them are going to be shorter, some of them are going to have more of a ability to intercept information. Mm-hmm. So it just really depends how um, the neuron's structured. Wow. So, so the, the stereotypical neuron that we learn about in our intro biology class is the multipolar neuron. Yes. Okay. Um, that's probably the closest to what you've seen. Like you have your cell body here um, and then you pretty much have your little dendrites that mm-hmm. are taking in inf- other information. And then the action potential will come down in a single axon and then we'll release um, whatever's at the end. Yeah. So that's pretty much what we end up learning, um, just to kind of get a basic understanding. But as you get farther into um, neuroscience, you begin to realize this is not completely the case. Um, There's a bunch of different types out there, and they all look different. And you're continuously finding new ones and new ones? Oh, of course. Um, Pretty much you're getting a new neuron a week, it seems, pretty much. Maybe not that frequent, but there's quite a bit out there that we're still yet to discover. Mm -hmm. That's the coolest thing. Neuroscience is something that really interests me, but I've always felt that it was a little bit over my head to, like, pursue. I don't know. I'm thinking about looking more into it, but... As you should. Um, Neuroscience really shouldn't intimidate you too much. It's just kind of a more specialized version of biology is how Mm. I would think about it, and blending it with psychology. Yeah. It's pretty much understanding why um, the brain works and functions how it does and how that may affect behavior is one way to look at it. How does it affect um, different processes in the body is another thing. So if anything interests um, you like that, I would 100% say go for it. Yeah, There's a lot you can do with it. So Interesting. Yeah, I um, my current major right now is uh, public health. Okay. And I'm going to get uh, on to graduate school for either PhD or medical to continue to do like research afterwards and stuff. Oh, okay, cool. But I would like to find something that complements it. Either I was thinking economics, um, neuroscience, or um, who knows, computer science. I don't know. You okay. know, you just said you added your second one uh, last semester. Um, this, semester. this semester. This semester. I was actually supposed to graduate in, in December. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just added on two more years. So. It's never too late to add on something you're interested in. Definitely, yeah. And what do you plan on doing afterwards? Um, so afterwards, I originally was going to go to grad school, mm-hmm. but once I discovered computer science, I realized I could get into the workforce a lot quicker oh, than yeah. going through, I don't know, six more years of grad school. Mm-hmm. So the plan is to work for a company that does either artificial intelligence, computational neurobiology, or even data science. Um, I would like to go into either of those routes. Okay. Data science, that's something I'm also interested in. I wanted to go to, um, or I want to go into, if not medical school, um, grad school for biostatistics. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's a really cool field. I, I, I do like numbers. I'm going to be okay. honest. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a math person. But I also, I like uh, science. I like life. I like research. Yeah. It would allow me to um, 
still stay in the research field, but uh, still, you know, handle what I'm really good at, which is numbers and data. Okay, cool. Yeah. Which is why I'm looking into all the programming stuff and then mm-hmm. starting to get oriented with uh, SAS and R necessarily yeah. <laughs> so I don't jump in and not know what I'm, you know. Oh, no, yeah. I 100% get that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just becoming a lot more useful looking into that and knowing um, stats is going to help you a lot, too. Yeah, yeah. And it's pretty well-paid profession. It is honestly. really well-paid. Well um, yeah. That was also part of the factor of me choosing not to go to grad school because you're pretty much living at the poverty line yeah. pretty much the entire time. Um, and I'm like, I can do that and wait eight years or I can jump immediately into a career. Right. So that's why I decided to end up doing. Mm-hmm. And so, if I ever want to go back and get a master's or a PhD, it's easy enough for me to do that since companies will sometimes pay for you to do that. Oh, yeah. And you can do it while you're working sometimes, too. Oh, yeah. If you- spread it out properly Mm -hmm. definitely that's a very smart decision and everything you obviously still love doing research during you know during undergrad and everything oh i absolutely love doing research um i would not trade that for the world Mm -hmm. now how do you think research has helped you as a just as a person in general even though you decided not to go to grad school? So pretty much when I started out, um, I was a very nervous and scared undergraduate who had absolutely no clue what I wanted to do and how to do it. Mm -hmm. I stumbled into research and I started to develop um, kind of more of a love and understanding of what I was doing. Yeah. I realized I really liked being able to um, analyze slices, look at and design my own experiment. But um, it made me better able to understand and portray what I'm doing. I used to be an awful speaker, so Mm -hmm. being forced to do uh, different presentations for um, the BRHI, the Brain Health Research Institute, at the end of my program, I had to give a 10-minute presentation. And I was scared out of my mind. After that, I was like, oh, this wasn't so bad. I was told I had a good presentation. I'm like, oh, okay, (laughs) cool. Um, I then proceeded to go on and talk and give a poster presentation at the Society for Neuroscience. Yeah. And that really started to build my confidence because that sounds cool. It was really cool. Um, When I presented, it was online, Mm -hmm. so it was kind of cool. You would be able to see people come over, and you'd have, like, a little crowd of icons surrounding your poster. And it was really, really cool being able to talk to all these world-renowned neuroscientists. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, I never thought I would have that opportunity. So it really gave me confidence, and I was like, oh, public speaking's not too bad after all. So that was really cool. And then it had me get a lot more organized as well. Mm -hmm. I am very scatterbrained and being forced to have a project and know where all your data is, how you're doing it, and um, pushing it through was something that I was able to develop. Like back then, I had absolutely no concept of time management. And now I am very, very particular in how I run stuff. So Mm -hmm. That was really cool, too. And I really like neuroscience research, and it had me want to talk about it more. So um, I ended up talking to a couple of neuroscience students, helped them get into research on their own, too. Yeah. And um, then I became a research ambassador here at Kent, and I love sharing my story and helping people take that jump into starting their own research. Mm-hmm. So I really, really loved doing it, and it it gave me a lot more understanding and appreciation for what the field does, and it made me, I don't know, more confident and better understand as well. Yeah. No, I feel the exact same way, and I have to say, Anna, you are a fantastic public speaker. I hardly think I'm going to have to touch this episode, honestly. Maybe more for, like, my parts. We're both research ambassadors. And I remember we talked uh, to a freshman class, what was it, two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and I think we both did a really good job up there and everything. Now, um, what's the Brain Health Research Institute like? I know you said you are part of that. So the Brain Health Research Institute 
it's been established for a little while, but uh -huh. pretty much it's a collaboratory of neuroscientists, and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be just neuroscientists, actually. We have people from all over um, the different departments at Kent. So there's a couple music professors included. There's a couple sociology professors. So if you're even remotely interested in like brain research, um, you're able to become a member. Okay. So they have something called the BRHI Fellows Program. Mm -hmm. And I was selected to participate in that in summer 2021. And they take a couple of students who are doing research and give them different workshops, the opportunity to do the 10-minute capstone presentation, yeah. which was really, really helpful. I've never given a presentation that long before, and it was really, really cool being able to do that. Um, they also do different events. Um, so they have um, different meet and greets. They have seminars as well. And then they also host the Kent State um, Brain Health Research Institute Symposium. And that is a great opportunity to hear not just Kent State professors, but Kent State alumni or guest speakers that come in and talk about their neuroscience research as well. Yeah, There's a poster presentation at that as well. So students are able to go up and talk to professors about their research. And it's just a really great environment to um, participate in. Most of the labs here are collaboratory as well. So they all work together and share equipment and um, share ideas about different projects as well. Mm -hmm. So they just had built that new addition a couple of years ago, and there's been researchers down there ever since. So it's a beautiful facility. I highly recommend going in. But it's just a really, really cool program. It's, it's in, the, in the basement of... Uh, the Integrated Science Integrated Science Building. building. I've been yes. down there during the summer. It was the coolest thing because uh, during the SHURE program, we lived here over the summer and there was no one here. And we would always just go downstairs in the Brain Health Research Institute. And we weren't doing, we weren't doing any type of brain research, but mm -hmm. we, took, we took that place over and just like set up our computers on the conference table. And there was like no one there. It was empty. Yeah, you know? um, that um, area is all open for students or whoever mm -hmm. would like to participate in there. Um, so like you'll see a bunch of uh, neuroscience students studying down yeah. there. And you're able to actually see into the labs from I that lounge that from the too, room, yeah. which is really, really cool mm -hmm. as well. That is, it's the coolest thing. I might think about joining that. Right. Um, interdisciplinary research is, is very powerful. Yes. And it's something I, I promote a lot. I'm a member of the Healthy Communities Research Institute, but and I would definitely like to get more involved. Those uh, initiatives are definitely something really cool that the university has to offer mm -hmm. for people wanting to get involved. Now, and if you had one more thing to share with the world, what would it be? Do not be afraid to reach out. Um, that is how the number one way to get connections and find out um, and open doors to what you really want to do. Mm -hmm. Without reaching out, I would not be in research today. Um, I ended up getting into it because I went up to a guy that said he needed volunteers, and I'm like, okay. So I ended up talking to him, and now I've been doing research with him for three years. And just talking it out will pretty much tell you um, and lead you into a million different uh, places. Yeah. So that's my number one um, takeaway from this. Don't be afraid to talk to people. You don't know what they'll say. You never, hmm. you never know where things will take you. Yeah. The professors that offer themselves to, um, you know, give you research opportunities, these are professors that like actually want to work with the students. You know what I mean? Like, like they're not scary professors. No, they're not. <laughs> they're really um, nice ones. I was really intimidated at first, but once you start talking to them, you realize these people are not robots. They're right. actually human, and they want to talk and share their research. Mm -hmm. um, it, when I first started talking to him, I sat there and learned about his research for two hours. Um, yeah. So they love to talk. They love to I, talk. We love listening. It's just fun, and it's great seeing someone being so enthusiastic about what they love. Yeah, that, There's nothing that can take away you know, from that. That's why I love this podcast so much is because I can, I can, I can see it. Like the, I, can, and I can feel it. I can feel the engagement. I can see the excitement in your guys' eyes. Research is a really cool thing because it gives you that opportunity to examine something that you are so confident about mm -hmm. and that it gives you the opportunity 
to present this stuff to the rest of the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, definitely great thing. Changed my life. And I really think it's going to change a lot of other people's. And we're both doing a really good job at uh, spreading that message out there, being the research ambassadors mm-hmm. that we are. So yeah. good work. Thank man. you. Well, Anna, it's been awesome having you on. Like I said before, you're welcome back anytime. Let just shoot me a message and I'll make room. Again, great work. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Mm-hmm. Again, this is your host, John, of The Research Review, creating a platform to inspire. Peace out.